can begin. Welcome. So welcome to everyone today. It's good to, to gather in this way. Synod Connect is something within our Synod we began talking about prior to COVID. And it's been an opportunity to gather once a month over lunch period for, for many of us and just engage with leaders from across the church with different themes, different uh, foci, and opportunity to have conversation together. Um, I'm going to begin with prayer and then I'll introduce our, our guest today. The Lord be with you. Yes, sir. And let us pray. Good and gracious God, you have gathered us in this way, in this online format. We give you thanks today for the gift of your servant, Chad, for the gifts that you've given him, for the gift of his family, of his vocation, his calling, and now for the gift of his time with us. Bless us in our conversation, in our learning, in our sharing. We continue to uphold Chad and the Lutheran World Federation and their ministry with and among us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's a, a pleasure for me to introduce uh, a friend, a colleague, I think, uh, and uh, a dear, dear man, our Reverend Dr. Chad Rimmer. Chad is the program executive for Lutheran theology and practice for the Lutheran World Federation. Uh, from the Department of Theology, Mission, and Justice. And I've asked Chad to take some time to share with us today just his own journey about his faith journey, about his family and his vocation as pastor and as theologian, um, and his vocation in and through the Lutheran World Federation. And then there'll be some time for some conversation if you have some questions or comments, either verbally or, or to use the chat as well. And then we'll close our time with just a couple of announcements, uh, a prayer, and we will conclude by uh, one o'clock Alberta time. So let's welcome the Chad. It's wonderful to have you with us. Welcome to our Synod, to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, Chad. Bishop Larry, thank you so much. And uh, I really, really appreciate the invitation. Um, and just to see friends around the room here, um, what a gift it is. And I was, I was, you know, accepted the invitation, of course, to, to come gather with you. Um, and then we talked about kind of the theme, you know, thinking about life and faith and vocation, like Bishop Larry just said, you know, and as I was thinking through it, I thought, you know, it might be easier if you had a, you know, one very specific topic, you know, you can just address it and go after it. But I was really grateful for the kind of the open invitation, because um, thinking about life and faith, the role of theology and faith, and then how that intersects our work together as a communion of churches is, is actually an exercise I see in synodality, you know, walking together. Um, and so what a great opportunity to come to a synod gathering like this. So first, congratulations, and thank you for this, for, for doing this together. Um, and then for inviting me in to, to walk a little bit. Uh, like on the road to Emmaus, um, you know, hopefully uh, your hearts burn when you think back on these conversations. Um, because it gave me an invitation too to really think, um, you know, in terms of what difference does it make to be Lutheran in my own life? Um, and therefore, what difference does it make uh, this Lutheran identity or this Lutheran uh, confession that we proclaim together. And just to let you know, I hope to end my, my uh, talk here, or my sharing uh, with that question to you. So now you may be distracted and not hear anything I say, because you're thinking about answering that question. But uh, I'm gonna, gonna kind of come back around and ask, you know, maybe if you reflect on that question, and we can have conversation about what difference does it make? in your life, in your call, in your vocation uh, to be Lutheran um, in terms of Lutheran identity. And the reason is this is part of a global process that we're in the middle of actually to consider Lutheran identity today. 
And actually, we're, we're saying Lutheran identities in the plural. Um, and there's some good reason for that. And uh, hopefully we can, we can talk a little bit about that. But I guess I can share, yeah, just biographically, um, you know, both to let you know who I am, but also to start thinking about what difference this makes uh, in my own vocation. I am uh, from the States. I was born and raised in North Carolina, in fact, and um, ordained in the ELCA. Grew up in North Carolina uh, as a Lutheran, uh, born and baptized. Both of my grandfathers are Lutheran pastors, uh, as is my aunt and uncle. Um, but I never once thought that this was my calling in life um, because my father was actually a chemist, an environmental chemist, and I grew up in the sciences. Um, biology was my, was my love. Um, and I went to the University of North Carolina to study that. Biology and chemistry was my first um, course of study. I grew up um, sort of going with my dad to, to take, uh, you know, water samples in the rivers and to, to, to do environmental checks in, in the mountains and as a scout, you know, backpacking the Appalachian Trail and um, really being formed by the land and of course the culture there that included um, the Cherokee Nation and um, you know the, the diversity that is the Southeast uh, in the United States. Um, and one place in particular was a Lutheran camp, Lutheridge uh, in the mountains. And uh, it was a place I went every summer and even more and um, you know, uh, growing up Lutheran, there were two things about growing up Lutheran there. One was that we were a minority, right? I mean, in some places, of course, like Minnesota, uh, you know, <laughs> everyone's a Lutheran. In North Carolina, no one knew who a Lutheran was. Uh, there were probably 12 of us. Um, and, uh, and so being sort of in a minority, you know, situation was part of that call to, to, to answer the question, what does it mean to be Lutheran? Um, but I did that in this place of kind of this engagement with creation all around me. And I had this sense that um, I was cared for in all creation um, and that I was called to do the same. And I recognize that that's a gift because this is not the case, of course, for, for so many children around the world whose childhoods do not have a sense of care and a sense of promise and hope. Um, so for me, that, that sense of a promise was formed in that sort of, you know, relationship uh, between that calling of faith and that experience of, of creation, the world, and our, our neighbors around us. Um, so I went, you know, after university about the end, my senior year, in fact, I felt this call um, that I didn't quite think maybe research biology was where it was, and that opened the floodgates. And the next thing I knew, um, everyone was telling me, uh, yeah, we've always thought you should be a pastor. Um, so in terms of where you're serving, I would encourage you to see those people around you and tell them early, because otherwise they'll go off and get degrees and other things, um, <laughs> which is good, in fact, though, because when we started this vocation, went into uh, global mission through the ELCA, uh, started in, in Denmark first, and we've been overseas now for 15 years. But um, in the process, I was doing some work with Green Church work with the Lutheran Church in Denmark. And this is what made me realize that I wanted to go back and do my own studies in ecotheology and environmental ethics. Um, it was a place where I realized that these two worlds of kind of biology and ecology and faith came together. And it sort of drew the circle back um, to bridge these two parts of my world. Um, and so I did that and studied environmental ethics and theological ethics at, in Edinburgh um, in the UK, and then went from there to teach in Senegal, where we were in West Africa then, in a, in a Muslim context, um, a totally different bioregion, 
Uh, I know Brian in El Salvador is experiencing this when you you go to you know when you, when when you have an experience of a different place in the world where where um, um, you realize how culture and the land and the place and the people inform uh, how you receive this promise and this good news and how that helps you interpret in new ways. Um, but at that point. Um, it was the time when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, with sarcoma, and we were forced to, to leave. We couldn't stay. Um, and that would be a long story, except that I want to just say that, thanks be to God, she's doing well today. And um, it, it was um, a deep experience of what we would call in Lutheran circles, theology of the cross. Um, where we see, of course, the light break in through dark places in the shadow of the cross, and just confirmed to me, really, um, that in this sort of Lutheran perspective on this promise that we've been given, and this faith that we're called to live out in the world, that being Lutheran is not easy. And I think that this is significant for us in terms of our vocation of what we're doing together, because while it is um, uh, a message of liberation uh, and freedom to engage this faith in the world, it is also hard. And there are no easy answers. And I think that for us within the family of the LWF, this is one significant moment in, 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 in history culturally that we're dealing with because there are a lot of faith voices that want to provide easy answers um, and are very willing to uh, you know, offer those answers um, rather than deeply engaging people in the work of faith and theological reflection. Um, because this faith um, calls us, our whole bodies and our whole culture, our whole experience of the world into this dialogue where being Lutheran, I like to say, is not so much a vocabulary, you know, a list of words that we can offer as answers, but it's a grammar. So not a vocabulary, but a grammar. No easy answers, but a way to read the word and read the world through this grammar of grace. Uh, and there we need to think theologically, we need to think faithfully, um, and be ready to deeply engage and reform systems uh, around us um, to be right and just and, and healing. And so that engagement with theology um, is what has become really important in my own life and call. And so I want to think for just a few minutes about uh, theology. What are we doing when we're engaging with that grammar? Um, and part of this, um, I want to. I want to say. L let me say it, it relates to the word and our words. I think these are two helpful categories when we think about what are we doing when we're talking about theology. We're talking about the word and our words. So of course the way that we think theology is our words about God or our God talk. And as confessional Lutherans, of course, we're generally convinced together about certain kind of commitments, theological commitments that we share. Um, I've already talked about theology of the cross or priesthood of all the baptized, um, word and sacrament, law and gospel. Um, but but is, are these words about God equal to what it means to know God. And I think that is where it gets interesting uh, for Lutherans, is because um, we can think about theology, our words, um, in terms of the way that we, that we think about God or that we perceive God and experience God in the world from our location. And here we give thanks for the diversity of theologies, the diversity of words and grammar that, that we use to interpret our experience. We think about systematic theology or pastoral contextual theology, and then feminist theology, womanist theologies, um, 
eco-theology. This, this relates to our embodied place in the world. And this gives us that grammar and that language to interpret our experience from where we are. But then we also have this personal encounter with the word, um, which is the object of our theologizing, which is God present in faith, Christ present in faith in us, which doesn't just consider, of course, um, who we think God is for us, but also who we think God is. And um, I'm also aware that we're having this conversation here just a few days before Valentine's Day. Um, and I was invited to think with, with our Lutheran friends in the UK this past week about um, this theme of love, actually, around Valentine's Day. And, you know, I was, I was thinking that in 1 Corinthians, we hear Paul talking about love, um, but Paul's actually talking about the stuff of God, the doxa of God. God is love, as it's put, you know, in 1 John, uh, which is why Paul says, of course, that the greatest among faith, hope, and love is love. That's the one that will endure, because in the end, when we're with God, there's no reason to have faith, because there's there's no reason to have faith in what you can see. There's no reason to have hope. It will, it will end because once we're with God, there's nothing more to hope for. But there will still be love because God is love. And if God is love, then that's the reason that God has two basic moves in the world. That's creation and reconciliation. Those are God's two basic moves. Love creates and love reconciles, heals. Um, and for me, this is the proper work of theology. It ought to reflect our words and our experience of what that word is doing in the world, it ought to reflect that basic movement of God. We're, we're being creative, we're being reconciled. And along the way, um, of course, we're going to engage in a variety of theological ways of reflecting on that presence of God in our midst. Um, and, and, you know, as Lutherans too, it's, this relates to my background. Um, we're also, we have different ways of thinking about how it is that we know this God. I mean, I think this is one of the gifts of our tradition um, to this day and age, this interdisciplinary um, moment of public engagement where we're seeking to be public theologians and really engage the world in creative ways, because Lutherans have always held uh, revelation and reason together in a, in a creative tension, but a good tension. Um, for me personally, this is why I love one of, I think the epiphany story, the epiphany cycle is uh, one of the most beautiful, because I think in the telling of the birth of Christ and then the, the coming of the Magi, what we see is revelation and reason. You know, the shepherds were, were brought to Christ by the gift of a revelation, um, whereas um, that star that was in the sky um, called upon the reason of those magi, you know, they were astronomers, they were people who looked to the heavens and, and uh, followed where reason led, and somehow, mysteriously, God works through both of these. Um, and I think this is part of what Luther's project was about, was to make sure we just get it right. We just get these two in the right relationship. And that is to say that what we can know of God um, is, is gift, is revelation. This, this comes to us as a promise. It's not something that we can reason our way to or certainly earn. But there's such a, such a strong role for reason. And that is cora mundo, when we have that relationship with God, then turns us towards the world. And that's where faith calls upon our whole reason. Everything we know, everything we are, all of our relationships and our different vocations and callings in life um, that really frees us then to engage the world and do the loving thing for our neighbors, for all of our creatures and uh, for the whole of creation. And so I think the, the proper work, the proper role of theology 
is to pull on these different aspects of revelation, of reason, of our place in the world, who, God, who we say God is, and who we experience God is for us. And um, to help us do that work of translating that faith into the disciplines in life where we're called. And I recognize all of us here, you know, our leaders and our synods, but in life we're engaged in many different ways and all of our parishioners and um, members in our congregations and ministries are engaged in so many different disciplines. And to translate this faith into those walks of life and those sectors is really an act of translation, translating that revelation into what it means for our callings in the world and in the public space. Um, and I say that, you know, having shared that we were, we were in Francophone West Africa, where we know that we're not only literally translating into different languages, um, where words can have radically different meanings, but we're also translating them into different systems and into different cultures and different um, um, yeah, cultural aspects of life um, where the gospel needs to be heard and can be heard in different ways. And here is really where um, it's similar to the work that Luther himself did by translating the Bible into the German language 500 years ago this September, in fact. Um, so being public theologians or theologians in the parish, this is part of our task, is to help do that translational work. Even if we may be speaking in the same language, um, there's still a lot of interpretive hermeneutical work um, to do. And I think this is where, um, as a communion together, when we think about how to interpret this faith, this is where we need each other as a communion of churches. Because you know, none of us has that one experience that can completely translate. And when we hear this same faith, the same gift, the same promise translated through the lives and the experience of another in a different culture, that can help us help define who we are. Um, and that is what we do as a communion of churches together. And what we offer as a gift, we say, there's a gift and a task of being communion. And I want to take just a minute to, to show just a, a few slides um, to, to, to kind of illustrate, at least you can see, you know, have some images um, as I just talk through a few minutes about some of the programmatic ways, even these interesting ways that we do this as a communion together. Um, and I promise I don't want to spend too much time here because this can get into program language and I really want to just have some time for conversation. But um, the LWF, you know, today is, um, is a global communion of 148 churches. And this is around uh, 99 countries, 77 million of us, uh, sisters and brothers around the globe. And we share this common Lutheran heritage, um, but it's shaped by the, the, the diverse context that we're in. Um, but it's worth remembering um, that we came to be as a global body in 1947. And this was after, of course, the experience of World War II. Um, and there was sort of a necessity to come together and to really talk as a global Lutheran family um, about who we are and what this faith meant after we'd seen what we were capable of, of doing. Um, and it was, it was based on four pillars then, rescue for the needy, which was basically refugees after World War II was the initial gathered gathering. Um, the second was common initiatives and mission, reaching out around the globe, um, then joint efforts and theological reflection, and then ecumenism, reaching out to um, engage with our, the whole Christian family, which at that time, of course, included the founding of the World Council of Churches. And I want to show this because it hasn't changed that much. There's some great news here. Um, those four pillars still exist. Um, we still engage in development and diaconeal work, and now the humanitarian sector through the LWF World Service 
we're one of the largest partners of the UN HCR, uh, faith-based partners uh, in the globe. And we've served, we serve 2.3 million refugees and interna internally displaced persons through 25 country programs around the world. We're still engaged in uh, holistic mission, proclamation, diaconia, developmental work around the world together. We keep pushing into dialogues and celebrating these significant milestones in terms of Christian unity. Um, both with bilateral dialogues and multilateral dialogues um, with our Catholic, uh, Anglican, Mennonite, Orthodox sisters and brothers, uh, Pentecostal and beyond. Um, and the one that I want to kind of focus on here, which I'm so happy that actually the square in this picture is uh, Erica, who's a member of ELCIC. So uh, you'd be proud uh, of her and her engagement with the LWF but is this focus on joint theological work, which we still continue today. Um, and we talk about theology as transformational theology. What we like to say is that we're doing theology for transformation, right? Recognizing that the word, word is always creative. The word goes out, Isaiah says, and doesn't come back empty. Um, so we're doing something in our proclamation. And if we're aimed at transformational theology, then it ought to be, we say there are four C's. It ought to be concrete. It ought to be creative. It ought to be critical. And it ought to be contextual. Um, and so those four C's for, for, for transformative theology kind of guide what we do. And we do that um, in different ways. We keep, continue to engage as churches in mission, even in programs like Waking the Giant, uh, helping churches engage the sustainable development goals. Um, continuing, as I said, to support people in need, humanitarian and diaconal work around the world. Um, continuing to push for those milestones in ecumenism and doing theology together is continuing to be a critical, a critical aspect of doing the work of both celebrating and understanding the diversity that we see across the communion in these 148 different countries, um, while continuing to recognize each other as belonging to this same Lutheran family, the same Lutheran confession. And as I mentioned earlier, that we say that's a gift and it's a task. The gift is the unity, uh, the presence of Christ in our proclamation and our word and sacrament. Um, and the task is thinking together through that diversity where it's challenging, uh, where we meet each other's uh, questions and rough edges. And what this takes is a deep hermeneutical conversation, a deep engagement. Um, in the work of interpretation. And as we do that together, we hold this uh, universal tradition, the shared tradition, the Catholicity of our confession based on this promise, this presence of Christ um, and the doctrine of justification that interprets this good news for us, uh, the way that's expressed in word and sacrament. But then, we need for that to be engaged in our context. Um, this cycle needs to be connected because if it only stays kind of this universal tradition, you know, it risks never having roots. It risks never being embodied or being contextualized and being creative and concrete as those two C's say. But if we only ever see who God is for us, through our local and contextual lens, then we might risk domesticating the gospel. And then we can make particularly scripture, but we can, we can take this promise and uh, put it to use, instrumentalize it for our own use. And so we need to have this, this hermeneutical cycle. We need to be engaged in this conversation with our friends uh, in different parts of the world. Um, that is basically 
Ubuntu, right? Um, I am because we are. And I need you and your story, and you need me and my story, and we need our sisters and brothers um, around the world and their story of how they perceive this gift and who God is and um, how it is that we're called to live it out today. And so the last thing I want to, to, to show and share is um, before we have this conversation, um, and I'm reminding you, I'm going to put that question back on the table. What difference does it make for you in your context? Um, but I want to show this video. I'll need to make sure that I have the correct tab clipped here. But this video is from um, the consultation on Lutheran identities that we hosted in Addis Ababa that began this process of considering Lutheran identities uh, that I spoke about earlier. And I could, if you have questions about this, I'd love to spend some time talking about it, but we're in the process of, of both sharing the results from this process, as well as creating a study guide, a pedagogical tool to come back to member churches so that synods and congregations um, can make use of it. But what we're finding here, of course, is that there's a dialogue between um, what is identity, which is a cultural uh, concept you know, of formation, and then uh, faith, or faith identity, which faith, of course, in our Lutheran framework is a gift. So we have these different parts of our identities that are never asked to be left at the door um, when it encounters this gift of faith, but to be transformed um, by that promise. And so just like we would ask, what does it look like uh, to be Lutheran for our sisters and brothers in Malaysia or um, in, uh, in Zambia, or in the Senate of Alberta and the territories. Um, this is a deep question for all of us um, to ask these questions about the gift we've received and the context in which they bear fruit. Um, and so I wanna just share this quick video just to share a little bit of your sisters and brothers around the world who have asked the same question and here's some of their answers. We receive God's grace in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, even though we do not have any right to God's love. To be in Reformation and be contextual, because God uh, isn't like in something fixed. God is uh, alive in our lives. To be rooted and grounded on the Word of God and the theology of cross. To embrace and experience the presence of the divine in the whole of creation. To be Lutheran is to value education and to think critically. It's to ask critical questions in my society. Living into the gray areas in a society that often wants to frame everything in black and white. Coordinated in an effort of one voice for justice. For serving my neighbor whole creation. Also it's about being ecumenical. It is to join hands with Christians of all sorts, locally, regionally, nationally and globally. Being a Lutheran means to make a difference. To live together, to influence the world and to be a sign of grace and mercy of God in our days. I'm a proud Lutheran. So there you are, friends. Um, and I want to just stop there so that we have some good time for some conversation, but just giving thanks um, for the gift that is the word and the promise um, that we have been, has been entrusted to us in this, this Lutheran tradition in the diversity of ways that we live that out um, and that you do in your callings um, for being part of this Lutheran family where we get to continue to ask this question with each other.
and discover the answer only when we're in moments like this where we can engage. And uh, then finally, just for this moment, the invitation to come walk with you for, for an afternoon uh, here. So thank you so, so much. I'll see, just see if there are any thoughts or questions or reflections. Feel free to un unmute yourself or to use the chat feature, whatever you're most comfortable with and to engage with chat. And of course, the question that I put on the table at the beginning, someone could feel free to jump in on that, is for you, you know, what difference has it made? The reason I asked the question that way is because it's the way we phrased it in our global survey that we sent out. Um, to churches within the LWF family. And it was an interesting way to ask the question. Um, and I wanna share, you know, towards the end of our time here to share one of the beautiful responses we received. But uh, the question was, what difference does it make in your life to be Lutheran? Which I love because that's different than saying, what does it mean to be Lutheran? Where we could provide doctrinal answers or, you know, all sorts of uh, answers, but what difference does it make or has it made to be Lutheran? Yes, Paul, please. And so um, I have a, a, a fascination with the word uh, synod because we, we use it to be a certain community and use the word synodality. Uh, I've encountered it in ecumenical contexts in the, in the past year. So uh, I'm just curious in, if in one or two sentences you wanna talk about um, like how that came to be an important word to you or what, what drives that. I, I think it's a, the walking together is a very interesting way to look at what a synod is to take a little bit of the edge off it's uh, the governance or the police or the something, but it's actually a walking together. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious how that word came to mean something to you. Oh, that's great. That's a great question. Yes, and I and I um, like the ELCIC. You know, in the ELCA, I grew up with this word as well. Um, the diocese we call synods, uh, like you. And so, to me, growing up you know, it was always, uh, it, it, it meant something geographic and kind of institutional. Um, that was the, the, the diocese, let's say. Um, and it wasn't until later, of course, that I realized that most Lutheran churches use uh, the term diocese. Um, and so it's actually a minority of the Lutheran churches who call them um, synods. I think that's true. Uh, or at least half, let's say. Um, so I have come to appreciate the, the real meaning, um, the original meaning of a synod. Um, synods being uh, the gathering, the meeting, um, the council of the, the, geograph the geographic area of churches under a bishop. So that walking together, you know, the word literally means walking together. Um, as I said, uh, sort of at the top, hinted to this Emmaus story. Um, the reason it's come to mean so much to me is because I really do believe um, my experience is being able to actually walk with, even physically, to go to you know someone's place to experience their life. Um, it, it allows you, and you know, hopefully through their culture, through their language, it allows you to actually hear. Um, in a different way, um, and to take the time, you know, to consider with someone. Um, so even if you think quite literally walking, um, if we go on a hike, which I do a lot <laughs> on a mountain, we're going to have the time. We're going to take the time, you know, and be in a dedicated, consecrated space to uh, do some good theological reflection, to get to know one another. Um, and what God is doing in our lives. And to me, that's, that's synodality. There's an intentionality to the relationship is we're going to walk. We're going to go from one place to the next. Um, 
so in that sense, it's not static, you know, it's dynamic. And I think if we view our synod that way, um, then it's not static. It's not viewed as a, as a demarcated geography, but rather a being together. And I think that's beautiful for a, for a synod. Oh my God. Yes. Chad, I'm I'm thinking of the the event that LWF hosted in in Africa around Lutheran identities, and we believe in the spirit. Mm -hmm. We had Cheryl Peterson with us last week for our annual study conference, and Chad and Cheryl were the editors of the LWF document that contained the the lectures and studies and so on, which I certainly commend to you. One of the things, Chad, that uh, interested me about that event post. Uh, Post experience was having a conversation with uh, Dr. Keiko Dreger Hestlein, who was one of the ELCIC reps there, mm -hmm. and of her sharing of stories, of narratives from people from all over the world that impacted her. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering if I might ask you to share uh, a story from that event that has stayed with you, that struck you, that uh, uh, spoke to you, that touched you. Um, with us today. Absolutely. And actually, this is going to relate to the question Paul just asked as well. Because for me, when I think about theology, um, the role of theology or the methods of theology, and I spoke about this earlier, about the, the diversity of theological methods um, and perspectives, we need that. And we have to have that. And part of the reason is we have to engage, we have to have, um, create spaces for different modalities of thinking theologically. And that's gonna be embodied, you know, that needs to come from, from different, uh, different people, those that are uh, disappeared, those voices that are silenced, those voices that are at the margins that need to be centered. Um, so I like to, Talk, I appreciate this field called theopoetics, okay? Um, meaning, what is the poetic, creative role of theology? What are we doing? It's not just a rational exercise, but we're actually, we're, we're using words or conversation or engagement to create. Um, and, and this is an important thing, too, because there's a certain aspect of diversity that needs to be seen in our theological discussions, right? To me, that's kind of an aesthetic measure of, of a theological discussion. You know, are the bodies different? Are the context different that are being represented? And that's a good measure of, you know, the breadth and the diversity of the discussion. The reason I say that is because in Addis, at that consultation, it would be really easy, and a lot of theological consultations in the past have been this way, where you bring together, you know, theologians from different faculties around the globe, and you talk about a theology of X, Y, Z, and you come out with some brilliant things, right? But we did not want to do that. We wanted to start this process as a descriptive process, as an inductive process, as a participatory process, that included theologians, sure, that included uh, church leaders and practitioners, sure, but that included um, people from all walks of life, youth, um, um, you know, um, groups within the Lutheran family that are underrepresented, indigenous voices, practitioners in every area of life. Um, and so what that did was, to make it a little bit messy, right? And this was one of the impressions of the conversation that just I loved. I mean, I don't mean messy in the sense of we had a good agenda. You know, we had a great methodology. It went really well. But the, the, the texture of it was just beautifully um, 
sort of messy and pushed in many different directions that needed to be considered. Um, and one of the moments that broke through was actually on the second night where someone spoke up um, and said, can we please talk about how our Lutheran tradition and our Lutheran heritage has caused pain in a lot of people's lives. And what we decided to do, and Keiko was part of this group, was to say, we're going to take a night unplanned, and we're going to create a moment for storytelling. And so, you know, rather than the kind of discursive, dialectic, you know, paper presentation, question and answer, we created a little liturgy, in a sense, for people to come and say, choose something about your experience of what it means to be Lutheran. Positive, painful, whatever it is. And we're going to give space for each person to come and take six minutes and tell a story. And then there has to be a minute of silence. And then the only response that anybody can give is a word of gratitude for having shared that gift. And we sat there, and this went all night. And we had heads of churches, heads of national churches come. And I know for a fact, um, I mean, of course, I'm not going to share uh, names in those stories, but there were heads of churches there, for example, who do not ordain women. There were heads of churches there who, um, who are having issues in terms of human sexuality and oppression of LBGTQ. Um, communities. And there were members there who were speaking from this experience, right? And speaking these truths into the same places. And at the end of the night, they were embracing each other. They were sharing words of, um, of, of, of forgiveness, of, you know, asking one another to hold together. Um, because the gospel that we shared that united us was stronger than the issues that we need to discern uh, together and a lot of these difficult issues that we need to work on as a family of, of a communion of churches. And, I, and so I lift that up because to me, that's another example of walking together and what it means to be in communion with each other is to hold those spaces. Um, and you know, it's a role that the LWF can play between churches around the world. Um, but it's also a role that you play as leaders uh, in the synod, as leaders in parishes and context for ministry to hold that space. Um, and that's deep theology, right? And those stories are real theological data, you know, where most people think that theology is papers and words. Um, this is theopoetics, and uh, there's, a, there's an art and a creativity to it. And uh, I think in relationship, that's when you can see it come alive. Thanks for asking that question, Bishop Larry. <laughs> We have time for perhaps one more comment or question, and then I'll turn it back to you, Chad, for any final comments, and then I yeah. couple of announcements. But please feel free just to jump in, everyone. So I'd like I'd like to start um, maybe by just saying a thank you, uh, Chad, for your um, willingness to be here and to share with us in the presentation that you made today. Um, just really a comment is that it it um, it opened for me a lot of different areas and uh, opportunities where I've um, in the past reflected on a number of things. And one of the things that really um, spoke to me were uh, questions that were left with um, all of us in Canada and particularly when we went through the truth and reconciliation mm -hmm. uh, period or commission. And those questions are these, are, is who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? Um, and when I look back and reflect on the purview of my life, I see I spent a lot of time there. Uh, and some of it is internal, 
but then it allows me to move externally and then to invite everybody else to come in. And uh, so I really appreciate you awakening that in me this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Chad, final, final words, final thoughts. Sure. You know, I said I wanted to leave you with this uh, kind of response from this young woman. Um, she was from the Asia region, in fact. Um, so just to kind of uh, pull this together, too, I, I just want to say that one of the one of the, you know, as a communion of churches, the gift and the task that I referred to, the gift is the unity, the gift of the word, the gospel that binds us, the real presence of Christ and faith in the word and sacrament that holds us together. And then the task is, you know, accounting for the diversity and um, the, uh, you know, the range of expressions of that gift of faith. But I want to say that this is something to absolutely Absolutely celebrate because we, you know, the prophets in the days of old had a difficult task because they received God's word symmetrically, meaning God gave them a word, they had to say that word, <laughs> you know, the same words, whatever. <laughs> that was the difficult part because they would say, You have to be kidding, you know, You're, you want me to walk into this place and say this word. It was no. It was hard to be a prophet, of course. Our prophetic task is a little bit different. We receive the word, which is Christ, but then it's asymmetrical. It bears fruit. It grows into something. So we receive the word actually like Mary did. We receive the word, and it grows in our bodies, in our context, through our gifts and our giftedness. So we're called to take that word, and we all receive the same word, which is Christ present in faith. But then we're called to, to grow that, and it takes on fruit and expression through our cultures, through our locations, through our embodiedness. And I, to me, that's what accounts for that diversity. And um, that is, that is this, this even in terms of biodiversity, that's the wisdom of life woven into creation. Um, so sometimes while it's a task, um, it is an absolute gift. It is the gift that sustains life. Um, so I'm grateful for this global Lutheran family that we get to do this with. Um, and I encourage you to, to reach out. Um, you have a gift in your bishop who's, who's uh, um, has the ministry that he has with the global church. Um, but we're here for the whole church um, in, in every ministry setting. And so if there are resources or people we can connect with, please, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and we can work, you know, to help share, continue to share this experience and this gift. And, and that response that that young woman from the Asia region made um, she said that this Lutheran tradition for her was roots and wings, which sounds like a paradox, you know, something that keeps you grounded and something that makes you fly. But I think it's perfect, you know, because the gift is of this tradition that we share are the roots um, that have us tapped in to that life-giving source. But the liberty that we have in this good news um, are like wings and, and we should fly and go different places. Um, but it's the, the word and sacrament that brings us back together to be able to uh, celebrate that gift of being one in this global body. So once again, just to give thanks for this gift and the invitation to be here with you and uh, greetings to the, to the whole synod. Thank you so much, Chad. Uh, um, continuing the language of gift, thank you for the gift of you and you're sharing with us today uh, in, in ways that are um, uh, will, will force us, invite us to listen to the recording, to hear again your thoughts and to, to give time to reflect and to think some more of what you've shared. 
Uh, this has been deeply rich and engaging. Thank you so much, Chad. And thank you to each of you for, for joining today. Um, in March, uh, March 10th, which would be our net, next Synod Connect, our National Bishop, Susan Johnson, will be with us. And Susan will be sharing um, uh, from the updated, revised, expanded edition of Praying the Catechism that her father, Pastor Don Johnson, did uh, 25 years ago, which has just been newly published, newly released. So Susan will lead us through one of the days of reflection and prayer, and then engage with us in conversation about the process of, of uh, preparing for this revised and expanded edition. So you're welcome to join us for, for that event March the 10th. Again, thank you to you, Chad, and, and let's conclude our, our time together with prayer. And the Lord be with you. I'll use a prayer from All Creation Sings for Faithful Living in Society. Sovereign God, your son Jesus lived within the structures of society, even as he spoke truth to those in power and challenged systems of oppression. Empower us to be courageous disciples and responsible citizens. Grant that our life in the public realm be grounded in love for our neighbors. Care for the most vulnerable in our midst and respect for the common life we share following the example of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Thanks again, everyone. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Thank you so much, Chad. It was just wonderful listening to you. I could listen to you for a lot longer. Thank you, Olaf. Well, let's do it again sometime. <laughs> We've got that recorded, so we'll 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 get Chad back. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs>